this dilemma. You know, we're also used to being professional and estranging ourselves from what we're talking about so we can talk about it. Um, but sometimes I think it makes sense to um, To remember what this is all about. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that that's the point. I think, if I may, this is why we should never forget. I mean, in academia, that we're talking about real people, and ultimately, if it doesn't have an impact, maybe we shouldn't talk about it. So that's <laughs> no, you try to take it for a long time, and then you're kind of like, okay, I can't fake this anymore. <laughs> Anyway, so, thank you. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Olimaya Stern, independent researcher and consultant. She's gonna be speaking about gender and emergencies. And uh, Dr. Stern is a researcher, consultant, and human rights lawyer from South Africa. She works as an independent research consultant focusing on conflict, gender, security, and the law. Over the past decade, Oli has worked in countries including Iraq, South Sudan, Central uh, African Republic, Sierra Leone, and Northern Uganda. She had consulted for various international organizations, research institutions, and NGOs. Oli has a PhD in law from the London School of Economics and a master's from Harvard Law School. Thank you, thanks for the introduction. And in my talk, I'm gonna go down to the level of the human, exactly what we've been talking about here. And to do that, I would like to start with the story of one woman that I've met in Iraq, which, who I, which the story I think illustrates a lot of what I'll say in, in the next 15 minutes while I speak. So about six months ago, I was running a discussion group with a group of Yazidi women in a camp in Duhuk. Duhuk is in Iraqi Kurdistan, and it's about an hour away from the ISIS front line. And I was, I was running a discussion group in a center, a violence against women center that I've been working in with UNDP. And I was talking to these women, and at some point, my translator said to me, this girl here would like to talk to you. She'd like to stay behind afterwards and tell you her story. I said, okay, sure. I sat in the end with the translator and this girl and a, a social worker and myself, and the girl started talking. She was about 17 years old, Yazidi, super pretty, like dark skin, these green, green eyes, which are very typical of Yazidi women. And she started telling me what had happened. Now, a few weeks before ISIS took over Shingal, or Sinjar, which is where she lived, her and her sister had escaped, and they'd escaped to a camp in Duhuk, which is where I met them. Unfortunately, they were the only ones in their family to escape. The rest of the family was, in, uh, was captured by ISIS and taken into captivity. And her and her sister lived in the camp for about a year, and after about a year, her father managed to escape from captivity with ISIS and came to the camp to live with the two sisters. The father, she doesn't know exactly what happened to her father, but what she does know is that her father had become, he wasn't himself when he came back. He had become unbelievably violent, so violent that eventually it became impossible to live with him in the tent. He couldn't make a living, he was unable to earn for the family, and this is a culture where men are the breadwinners, where it's very difficult for women to earn. So she sat there in front of me telling me, I don't know what to do, I can't go to the tent, he's so violent, we have no food, we have no money, I have no clothes, we have nothing. I said, I looked at her, I didn't know what to say. She goes, but this is not the story that I actually wanted to tell you. I said, okay, what would you like? What did you want to tell me about? She said, I want to tell you about something that happened a year before ISIS took over Sinjar and we fled. I had one more sister, she said, and the sister was 16 years old and the sister had been raped. And she said that the sister had fallen pregnant as, as a result of this and the father and the brother found out that she was pregnant and they said, this is going to shame the family. There's nothing else to be done. The sister needs to be killed. Kurdistan is a context with very, very high rates of um, honor killings. They decided they had to kill her for the sake of the honor of the family, but this father and the brother did not want to do this themselves, so they asked the sister, who's the girl that I was speaking to, if she would do this. They handed her a can of gasoline and a match, and they sent her into the next room to kill her sister. The sister, the other sister, didn't want her sister to do this to her, and she had taken matters into her own hands, so she had doused herself in gasoline. And when this girl walked in, her sister was in flames, screaming in pain. Eventually the father came and shot the sister, and, th and a, a few weeks later, uh, ISIS took over Shinjal, Singal, the whole family was captured, and then they found themselves a year later in the camp. Now why do I tell you this story? I tell you this because I think it really clearly illustrates the thing you need to understand if you're gonna look at gender and emergencies, and that's the layers. I feel like often the media talks about the one layer, 
the war with ISIS, the catastrophe, but they don't talk about the layer of the war coupled with the layer of traditional practices over the layer of patriarchy, over the layer of poverty. And only if you understand all these layers at the same time can you really start to get any sense of what it's about being a woman in, 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 this, in an emergency. So my talk is going to talk, tell you a little bit about the ways in which women experience emergencies differently. Women, have, women and men both suffer in emergencies. I'm not for one moment saying women suffer worse than men, but they do suffer differently. Their experiences are different. They have different needs. They have different vulnerabilities. They're targeted in different ways. They participate in different ways. While men fight, women participate in different ways. And so if you really want to get a sense of how to deal, assist populations, you really need to start to get a sense of these needs. Any programming that doesn't take account of these needs can't, can't hope to, to, to deal with what it's, what it's hoping to deal with. And what I'm going to show you for the next few minutes across various different types of humanitarian programming, I'm going to show you how the gendered needs are different and how programming needs to take account of these differences, even if that particular type of programming has nothing at all to do with gender. What, what I'll show you also is that if you don't think about gender in various aspects of programming, what you can actually do is you can compound inequalities and you can actually make the, the situations even worse for women in the ground. And this is what I want to highlight to you in our, across a number of thematic areas. So let's start off talking a little bit about displacement. We know that displacement, like everything else, is gendered. But let's look at, unpack a little bit how it's gendered. First of all, the numbers. The often quoted statistic is that 80% of displaced population are made up of women and children. Now, I've spent countless hours on the internet trying to find where the statistic came, came from, who made it up, and also what exactly, what part is women and what part is children, because it's very um, problematic to clump women and ch children as one clump. I can't find the source of that stat, but what I can tell you is that this is, this is a statistic you hear everywhere. So, but what we do know is that in displaced populations, often there's a high percentage of women. Often the, the percentages of women are far higher. Where are the men? How does that make sense? Well, the men are often fighting. They're recruited into armed groups, and the men are often killed. Far more men are killed in conflict. And so what you're left with often is, is women in displaced populations. We also know that women have very different experiences of displacement while they are being displaced. And let me just paint out some of the, small, some of the ones. Um, think about a tent. Think about people living in a, in a camp with a tent. A, a, um, a, a tent often doesn't have a lock on the door. A tent can be slit with a pocket knife. Women, particularly from a safety point of view, are very vulnerable when living in temporary structures and housing. But they're vulnerable from a safety point of view. In many societies, women bear the brunt of feeding children and, and of providing for their children. And this does not stop in times of displacement. So even in displaced population, it often falls to women to find food. And this puts a really high burden on women. They, spend a lot, they have a lot of pressure feeding their kids in these situations. And it also makes women very, very vulnerable to exploitation, including to sexual exploitation. You hear in context after context, people trading a bag of rice for sex. Um, unfortunately, this is all too common. So um, these are the sorts of experiences that women have in displacement, which, women, which men don't experience. Um, Often the problems of displacement are exacerbated in patriarchal societies. And let's unpack some of the ways in which this happens. In, uh, if you see refugee camps in highly patriarchal contexts, often families are registered by the husband's name. So the, the family is registered in the name of the father. Mm -hmm. Now let's think about what that means for a woman. It means that a woman who is not getting on with her husband, a woman who is in an abusive relationship, can't leave the family because then she'll have no aid, she'll have no tent, she'll have no food. This is really problematic. It gives a lot of men power to manipulate the situation. Um, in a context like Iraqi Kurdistan, where I work at the moment, the public space is highly dominated by men. Men work. If you go into restaurants, it's men who are serving in the restaurants. If you, men are the cleaners. Men take up the jobs. Women, you don't see them as much in the public space. What does this mean for women who are trying to earn an income without men? It means it's incredibly difficult to earn a living. Um, I've heard I had conversations with Syrian women who complain. One woman said to me, she was an older woman, not very attractive. She says, it's so difficult for us women. Only the beautiful Syrian women can get jobs. They'll only give the very beautiful women jobs because they know that they can get something, something extra from them, and they don't want to get it from us, um, which is just such a thing to hear. The European migration, which you've spoken about a lot today, one of the things that's really struck me in all the coverage of this crisis is that you see in visual after vigil groups, uh, visual groups of men. It's men who are primarily going to, to Europe. This has shifted somewhat in the last months, but certainly for the larger part of the crisis, it was primarily male, men. 
What seemed to be completely missing from the media coverage was the question, gosh, that's strange, where are all the women? Well, I have found where the women are. The women are living in camps on, by the borders. The women are living in camps in Kurdistan. And when you go there, you see these camps that are filled with women. Their women are just sitting and waiting. In some situations, the man, ha the man has said that he will send for the women. He goes there with, to Europe with the plan of earning money to, to send for the family afterwards. But often they don't plan to do that. I've met so many women who received a text message from her husband saying, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving, you're by yourself, I'm abandoning you, I'm divorcing you, by text message. You see camps in Kurdistan of women sitting and abandoned with absolutely no resources and nothing else. Um, men sometimes sell their tent I, to, to pay for the passage to Europe. I met a family, the father had sold the family tent, leaving the, the mother and the children on the, on the muddy road of the refugee camp because it needed the money for passage. So these are just some of the ways in which displacement is unpacked if you look at it from a gendered perspective. Let's look at another thematic area, and that's safety. Clearly one of the biggest things you want to do in any sort of emergency programming is protect the safety of people. You want to get them away from bombs, you want to get them away from the source of catastrophe. But again, if you want to ensure safety, you need to look at the different ways in which women and men's safety is, is threatened in, in emergencies, and you need to program for these things differently. And what we know is that women and men face highly different threats. Men, as I said before, men are killed. Far larger numbers of men are killed in conflict. In, people, fighting groups go into villages and towns, they round up the men and they shoot them. We've seen this often in the ISIS war. Women are, are targeted in different ways. And the biggest way that women are targeted is sexualized violence. Not the biggest way, but one of the most common ways and one of the ways that we need to think about in programming. Um, this, this will not be new to you, but we've all heard report after report of increasingly sexual violence being used as a weapon in conflict. What that means is in the olden days, in, in conflicts of the past, sexual violence is more incidental. You had a group of drunk soldiers who found a woman and they would rape her. But that's not what we see in many contexts today. We see systematized, intentional tar sexual targeting of women as a strategy of conflict. And certainly what we've seen in the ISIS war is a mechanized slave trade. Thousands and thousands of women, particularly Yazidi women, like the women that I described, have been kidnapped and have been sold as slaves. And they're sold in slave auctions, they're then married to the people so that the marriage has some sort of a religious legitimization, according to that understanding of the religion, and they're used as a sex slave and then resold afterwards. Somebody told me the other day that so far into the ISIS war when funds are running out, the value of these slaves has become so cheap that one slave is now worth less than a packet of cigarettes. And what used to be sales for marriage that lasted about a year are now marriages lasting just a couple of days. So th this is, if you want to think about women's safety in this sort of a war, these are the sorts of issues that are affecting their safety. In addition, it's not just the safety threats from the outside. It's also safety threats from within the community. Domestic violence world over rises in times of emergency and times of conflict. We've seen that in, in conflicts all over the world. Um, and if you want to protect women, you need to think about this problem. Displacement is incredibly stressful. People are living in close quarters in very, very stressful, st stressful situations and it, violence rises. Um, a woman in Kurdistan told me that her husband hits her and she hits her children now. And, and because she, she says it just happens, I, I'm so frustrated I hit my children. Um, th this is what happens. So these are the things you think about. Another thing which rises is harmful traditional practices. Um, things like child, child marriages rise in, in many of the conflict areas that I've worked in, child marriages rise dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, desperately poor people um, have to give up their young children for marriage in order to get um, the dowry or the bride price or any bit of money that they can. Well, uh, something awful which I've heard in Kurdistan, and a practice I've never heard of before, is of a two-day marriage. A man will be married to a teenage girl for two days, after which time he will divorce her. And uh, in those two days, he'll be able to sleep with her legally in terms of the religion uh, before divorcing her, and he'll pay the parents something small for, the, for being able to do this. Unfortunately, this then leaves the young girl without her virginity, which is a very, very prized or, or important resource in, the cult in these cultures. So these are the sorts of problems that come out. I've already spoken about honor killings um, before. So just to repeat the point, if you want to think about safety, you need to think about it, you need to think about the particular threats that women and men are experiencing in order to be able to target those properly. Let me, I'm gonna skip out, um, no, I'll talk about food and then I'll skip out the next one because I'm short on time. Food um, is one of the traditional, the classic things that is provided in an aid operation. But again, you need to think about what the gendered pictures are here, and I'll just point out a few of them. 
Um, often, again, families are registered by the husband's name, and so, again, is the food entitlement. So the man will be entitled to food, not in, and, and the woman won't have any claim to it. So if a woman is not with her husband, she has no way of getting food. In many cultures, women eat last. They'll only eat if there's enough food to go around. So if aid organizations reduce the, the quantity of food that's given per month, this often doesn't mean that everybody goes a little bit hungrier. It often means that the women don't get food. So people who are thinking about quantities and thinking about these things, you need to consider this from the gendered lens because the result becomes very different for men and women. Thinking about things like distribution, distribution points. At, at the points of food distribution, the women are very vulnerable to sexual exploitation, the bag of rice for, for sex. Um, often what we've, one of the problems we've seen in Iraq is that the food is handed out in really big sacks per month. And these are sacks that only men can carry. They're not, a woman can't carry this by herself. And given the number of female-headed households where there are no men, this leaves women with a huge dilemma of how to get the food back to their house. They're unable to do so. Um, again, distribution points that are, that are located too far from the tents mean the women are subject to harassment, including sexual harassment on the way back to the camps. So all these sorts of things, need, those, those doing food programming need to think about these sorts of things so that they can find ways to mitigate them. Let me skip sanitation. Quick, quick example on health. One of the camps that I'm working in in, in Kurdistan is, it's called Karagas Camp. It's about an hour from Erbil. And there's a population of about 20,000 and over the last few months, I think there were about 1,000 pregnant women at the same time. Um, there were no obstetric facilities in the camp, although the camp has a clinic. They didn't have any ultrasound facilities or delivery facilities. They also didn't have an ambulance. This ambulance I actually took in South Sudan. The, this is what the South Sudanese ambulances look like. But it's a similar point. They'd had an ambulance in Karagos camp. It was no longer working. And this is, if you think about what this means for pregnant women, there is no public transport nearby. They can't walk to the city. It means that people get completely stuck and are unable to deliver in, in the hospitals. So even just unpacking something like health from a gendered perspective in a camp, you, run it, you come across these problems. Let me begin to sum up. And to do that, let me get back to the layers that I began the talk talking about. You can't think about any type of programming in an emergency context without thinking about gender, and you can't think about it without thinking about culture and the way that these two things interrelate. Any programming that doesn't take into account the effects of culture and cultural practices and traditional practices uh, can only hope to fail. Um, I'll give you a quick example. In Kurdistan, many, families, uh, many Syrian families and Iraqi families, they don't let the women leave the, the camps without a male escort. Women are not allowed to go outside without. So some people have tried to do livelihoods programming, allowing people to make a living. So one of the suggestions was to allow women to work in the nearby town in a factory. Again, that won't work because women can't leave the tent. People who've put clinics, health clinics outside the camps, again, the same problem, women can't access the clinics. So you, you think to yourself that in a time of crisis, of course they will just get over those cultural um, rules, but that's not the case. In actual fact, in times of crisis, people hold on to cultural rules in a much stronger way. Mm -hmm. And any programming that doesn't take those into account and make provision for that is doomed to fail completely. So let me conclude by going back to the woman that we spoke to, that I spoke about in the beginning of the talk. She was displaced. She was living in a terrible, terrible situation in the camp. She was waiting for her hometown to become livable again. But what was most pressing and what was most painful for her was the fact that her father was beating her in the tent and the memory of what had happened a year ago before ISIS even took over the town. Um, and it's these layers that make up her experience. If you're only thinking about the layer of the conflict, you truly are missing so much of the depth and so much of what it actually is to be a woman in these contexts and how they need to be helped. So you really do need to look at all these layers to really be able to get at how to help people in these situations. Thank you. So our discussant, um, Dr. Timia Spitka, uh, she's a Sophie Davis.